Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. We're talking uranium with Matt Batty Alley, edi editor of the New Energy Investor, published under Mangrove Investor. We will post a link to that Mangrove Investor website. Now, Matt, as I said, we're talking uranium. You came to us with the idea today to focus a bit more on the uranium sector because of some of the news out of Japan. Quite frankly, you're seeing a shift in Japanese policy. We're seeing a shift in a number of different countries becoming more friendly and embracing the potential of nuclear energy. It's something that as this changes, because boy, oh boy, do governments ever turn their back on uranium and nuclear a while ago. As that changes, we've already seen a huge bounce in the price. We've seen stocks do really well. You, I think, were thinking that maybe this could have run its course, but now you're thinking that there's another leg higher. Break down what Japan alone you think could drive this market. Well, thanks for having me again, guys. Yeah, I was a bull in 2022, and we finally saw it lift off in 2023, and we put our readers into companies like Next Gen Energy and the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust and that they did really well through 2023, kind of topped in the beginning of 24. And then, for example, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust is down, I think, from a high of about $25 per share. It's trading under $20 today. I've been watching this trend and thinking, well, it might be time to take profits. And I actually started out to write an essay with that in mind, preordained the way the topic was going to go. And I started looking into what am I missing? Like what could be the driver for higher uranium prices and figure, and I thought I wasn't going to find anything. And actually I stumbled across an article in the Japan times that said, Japan is desperate to bring more chip makers and data centers into the country. They see that as a place where they can grow and they can develop their GDP in a positive way. But the problem with that, I, people may or may not know this, but data centers are insanely energy intensive. And so, you know, Japan's in trouble. Like right now, they spend more money importing fuel for energy, for electricity, than they make exporting cars. Like that's crazy. And so they want to bring, on one hand, they want to bring the high energy intensive industry into Japan. And at the same time, they have to import coal and, and natural gas to generate the energy. It makes no sense until you realize they've got massive amounts of nuclear energy on standby as, as a consequence of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster in 2011. They have the single largest reactor uh, plant in the world. And it's, and I'm going to butcher the crap out of this name, but it's called the Kashiwazaki Karariwa plant. I apologize to all the Japanese speakers out there who know how to pronounce that word, but that's the world's largest nuclear power plant and it's idle and it could come online very quickly. And as you said in the intro, the political will has shifted in Japan and nuclear is now seen as necessary to kind of grow the country's economy. And so if they turn this power plant on, it will use between 1,600 and 2,400 metric tons of uranium per year. And if that sounds like a lot, it is. That's, that could be as much as 4% of the world's supply from that plant alone. So imagine turning on a single power plant could increase the consumption of uranium by 4%. So the question, is that built into the current price of uranium? And I would say maybe it was at one point, like when things really got out over their skis in late 23 and early 24. But since things have pulled back, I think people are forgetting about this. And I think it's really important to recognize that Japan doesn't have to build nuclear reactors. All they have to do is turn them on. So it's not 10 years. It's not even 10 months. It could be as quick as 10 weeks to turn some of these things on. So that's what I see. And so instead of looking at this as maybe a point of exit, I'm now coming around to the idea that this may be a point where we add to our position. 
Yeah, Matt, it's interesting because we've been waiting since 2011 for those Japanese reactors to come back online. And I think that now with the desire to be a tech hub, well, they already are a tech hub, but to further that tech hub with AI and with a lot of these data centers, they're having the same realization that a lot of countries are, that if you want to have these big data centers, you need 24-7 baseload power. And you're not going to, I hear all these ideas, like you're going to do it with solar panels. Of it, and you're not, you're going to need something that's intense. You're going to need that gas plant and you're going to need nuclear power. So that's a big driver. And as you say, it can come on immediately. But I mean, this ties into the theme of a lot of reactors also being extended in many countries. And then look, you still have stuff like China building 21 reactors, India building eight, Turkey building four. And there's so many South American and Middle Eastern countries building a couple that there's a big demand side building here, even if the J Japanese thing doesn't happen. So how could the Japanese reactor start if it happened suddenly spike the punch bowl, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, the question is where, where is the uranium going to come from? Because one of the things we know is that from 2011 to maybe the last couple of years, Japan was selling down its stockpiles of fuel, right? That was one of the things they were doing to offset the costs. And they were massive. The, the, the cost to rehab the Fukushima Daiichi plant alone was in the hundreds, m many hundreds of billions of dollars. And the, the cost to, to idle these plants, like it's not free to just set these things off to the side and keep them up, up to date but just not have them run and not sell any of their power. So they were selling down their uranium. So, you know, it turn, you turn around and you look at, okay, we could have instant demand. Where is the supply going to come from? And the supply is an issue right now, right? Even though Canada is putting, is, is producing, you know, all time highs for uranium, there's less available because of the, oh, I forget the name of that program, the warheads. Megatons to megawatts. That's what it was. Megatons to megawatts. That program had ended and that was, I forget what the statistics were on that program, but it was, that was a significant amount of fuel. So, you know, that, yeah, I think we need more uranium and I think that makes, you know, existing development projects more valuable, right? Because, you know, the guys that are producing today, that's great. You have Cigar Lake and Rabbit Lake, Cameco, they're producing massive amounts from high grade but they're finite. All mines are finite. And so I always, I, I use the analogy of a mine is like a loaf of bread in a sandwich shop, right? You can only make so many sandwiches and then you've got to have the next loaf of bread. And so I'm looking out toward who's got the next projects, who has the next development project so that when Saudi Arabia's reactors come online, who will be supplying the uranium to them? You know, uh, so that's, those are the sorts of things that I'm thinking about right now. But yeah, I don't, I think that when you turn on these plants in, in Japan and they begin to compete, maybe they're already competing. I don't know, but they're going to need to compete with the existing demand for those new uranium tons. Where's it going to come from? I think it's going to raise the price. Let, let's go further down that road then, Matt, because you are right. There aren't a ton of uranium mines out there, and there are a few development plays, but stuff like some of the more well-known plays like Next Gen, it's just been sitting there waiting to get built. So do these programs, do these projects come online with a massive injection of funds? Do you focus in North America for more domestic supply? Where do you focus when it comes to any of these projects that are kind of at the starting line, getting ready to go? Yeah, I mean, that that is an outstanding question. The And, and it's not just a uranium question, it's a mining question in general. What are your risks and where are your risks? Because, I mean, as we saw in Panama when, you know, <laughs> was it first quantum had worked in good faith on an, with an agreement with the government inve investing billions of dollars, exploring and developing Cobra Panama only to have the freaking Supreme court turn around and go, oh yeah, that agreement. Yeah. That's unconstitutional. It's a terrible precedent to set because what it means is that it makes getting capital for any sort of mining development plan that much more difficult. And it's not just limited to Panama. There will be banks all over the world pointing at Panama and saying, well, yeah, we're going to have to charge you an extra couple of points on this loan because of the, the additional risk. And it's just, it, it, it makes it very difficult 
to figure out where to invest. Do you go to a place where the environmental regulations may be a little more lax, but there's corruption? Do you stay in North America where, you know, people don't want mines? They don't even want windmills, let alone uranium mines. It, it makes it very challenging to figure that out. I mean, I like to find, I, I think NextGen is a great example. You know, the that I love the Rook One project. And I, you know, I think that they've done everything that they could possibly do in terms of making this in a, a, a modern, and I air quote modern, but a modern mine where you have a small footprint, keeping the mining underground so that it's not, don't have the, that you reduce the risk of surface water contamination. These guys did seven years on their environmental uh, assessments. So they understand the environment. They have a great baseline in place. You can only do so much. It's very easy. And we've seen this forever in mining and oil and gas. It's very easy for one of the NGOs to come into a community and say, Hey, if you let that mine get built, they're going to, they're going to irradiate your water supply and all your kids are going to be injured and they're going to get sick and they're all going to get cancer and it's all be cause you let them build that mine, right? Now the mining company has the burden of proving a negative and every kid that gets sick, regardless of whether or not it's the mine's fault, will be blamed on the mine. Uh, and so it, it is, it takes something that is a very challenging, but necessary industry and makes it really difficult to do. And that extends obviously over to investing because every one of these things adds risk. So yeah, I'm very particular about the development. That's why the first thing that we had put in our portfolio was actually the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, because that is just, that was a very low risk way to play the move in uranium prices. You don't get the same leverage to the uranium price that you would with a development or an exploration project. But at the same time, you don't have the risk of seizure by a government because you're the mine agreement that you signed 10 years ago is suddenly deemed unconstitutional. Well, Matt, to the points you raise, as far as the jurisdiction risk, you know, you don't have to look any further than Niger just last year, where there was a coup in the government and it shut down 5% of the uranium supply out of the French producer, Orano. And then at Kazakhstan, which is where Cameco has invested in JV with them, as has Russia, and that they were the big swing producer. They're the Saudi Arabia of uranium. They can't get enough acid to produce for the next year or two. And so those supplies didn't come on nearly as fast as people were expecting. So what you have seen is domestically in the U.S., five companies go into production or are going into production this year and they are bringing on supply. And you are seeing some in Australia coming online and bringing on supply. So and as far as next gen, it's still years away from being in production. It's actually denizens that the next up to bat as far as their in situ Phoenix project trying to bring that in. So would you suggest that investors look at these areas of Canada and North America in general, United States that can bring production online while everything else seems to be on hold? Yeah, I definitely think that's the case. The, the Again, it always comes down to economics for me. And so I, with the in situ leach, I love that idea. I mean, you're basically injecting carbonated water into the ground and it pulls the uranium out and you pump it out the other side. They just have to get the economics uh, for me. I, but I do the, the domestic ones. There are places in the U S though, where they don't want this stuff. I mean, there are at least two really good uranium deposits in Virginia of all places that will never be mined because <laughs> The Virginians were like, not just no, hell no, you're not mining uranium in Virginia. But they're, you know, so that they're again, places where you have to, you have to test the waters before you invest. But yeah, no, I like the Denison project. I'm very, I'm still partial to the big Athabasca Basin high grade stuff. I mean, that to me is very attractive. I mean, it's hard to go wrong with grade. And when you have an area that those projects like Rough Rider, they're the grade in them, the like Cigar Lake is, is a great example. 200 times the world average. I mean, that's pretty, pretty amazing. Can we dive in a little bit more to the Athabasca Basin? Because it is one of the most well-known areas that I guess has a lot of exploration. It also has a lot of companies exploring there. And it's like all around or a lot of them are around next gen. But 
look, there's a lot of exploration companies that have just broadly come into the sector. And that is one of those kind of area plays that when uranium gets hot, people pay more attention there. How do you go about filtering through all these exploration companies that have land in the Athabasca Basin? Yeah, I mean, that's where you need, you need to either be a geologist or read letters written by geologists. The Athabasca Basin is a great place for a company to do closeology and raise some money and have a really nice office in downtown Vancouver on the 30th floor overlooking the bay and not too much else. It's a challenge to work up there. There's a lot of lakes and you have to really understand works, how the uranium ore bodies work. And the difficulty is if you're not drilling these things, then you're just using like scintillometer. You can fool investors pretty easily. I'm a cynic when it comes to some of these projects. I typically wait until I see at least one good round of drill hold before I go in there because there's really, that's the truth machine. Geophysics. It's basically like statistics. You have lies, damn lies, and statistics. In geology, you have lies, damn lies, and geophysics. You know, that I like to see, I don't mind missing out on that first little blip, especially not in Athabasca, because if they, if you get a sniff and you have a good team, and that's the other key to this is knowing who's looking, who are the experts. I hate seeing generalists. If you have a geo and they're like, oh, we have a, 15 year geo who spent 10 years working in South Africa, looking for platinum. And he's now looking for uranium in Athabasca. That's not great. So like I said, I like to see companies that have more than geophysics in an area play. I like to see results. Well, Matt, at least the good news is that there is about a dozen companies that have nothing but uranium geos that are well-seasoned and have spent the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, in that area, there's a lot, there's again, about a dozen companies that are doing good work. They got the right teams. The problem with the Athabasca Basin though, is that it's nowhere close to production in this cycle. So if we need uranium immediately in the next couple of years, it's not going to be coming from the Athabasca Basin, even from something like NextGen. The only project, again, that could even get close is an ISR project. But when ISR projects, basically every project right now across the world is economic at $90 uranium at what they needed with 60 to 70. So with everything being economic, do you expect to see maybe more of a rush from other countries that say, Hey, we can get into the game too, and do it quick and dirty. Like Hatchik Sam was doing Ubekistan is one that's coming up the ranks. For example, do you think we'll see more out of Australia? Do you think we'll see just because of the high price incentive people put in projects because everything is now economic, you could basically put any project in production. Do you think anything will be fast tracked or any government? will fast track projects. And that, that is a great question, Chad. The answer I think is no. I mean, it takes more than having uranium to being able to produce it. And I say that really in the context of going to Iraq and looking at oil companies in Iraq. And this was a million years ago. This was before the Syrian war. I went up to Kurdistan. So the North part of Iraq and this place has, it's like, the old Beverly Hillbillies movie. I mean, you could damn near shoot a hole in the ground and, and hit an oil well. There were a bunch of Canadian juniors there. The problem was having the expertise there on the ground because getting someone to go there was expensive and getting the equipment there, right? And so the question is not really about finding this stuff, but it's about the, you know, the cost of the development in some of these places. Can you get the equipment there? I think Kazakhstan really was supported by the Russian mining industry to develop its uranium, right? I, I think it might be more complicated than we think, it, more difficult than we think to do. Oh, it always is, right? And that's why it's not just so easy to see massive spikes in supply, but hey, there's a lot of companies that have now changed their name, re-entered the uranium space, and they're going to be trying to tell us that they can bring stuff into production very near term. We'll see if that actually happens. But overall, sounds like you're back in the bullish camp for uranium. The uranium price has been doing quite well. These stocks have been doing fairly well, too, especially when you pull out a one, almost two-year chart. But we'll see where it goes from here, though. Matt, thank you very much for breaking down why you're back in the bullish camp and uh, addressing some of our questions when it comes to the stocks you're looking at. Again, check out Matt at the New Energy Investor, published under the Mangrove Investor website, which is linked below. Matt, thanks again for your time. Have a great rest of your week.